Well, hello there, friends, and welcome, welcome, welcome to today's very special episode of Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Why is it so special? Well, it's no different than your average episode, except for the fact that it's not. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do have amazing guests joining me today. Author, journalist, writer, thinker, commentator, the brilliant Celeste Headley joins me today. Very excited to have Celeste back. And then after that, I've got Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg joining me together for the first time in about a month and doesn't disappoint. Neither of these conversations do, and I'm very happy to bring them to you. I'm sorry if you missed last night's subscriber hangout. You missed also the big news, which I'm still going to keep under wraps, but you might have a pretty good idea about what it is concerning me and a potential run for town council. But I have to make an official open public announcement about that, so I'm, I'm going to hold off. But there's rumors out there. There's a lot of questions, a lot of rumors, a lot of answers if you want to dig hard enough. Anyway, if you joined us last night, thank you very much for joining us. If not, well, then you missed out. We always have a great time at the subscriber hangout. Last night was no exception. I'm very happy to have you here, though, today. If you're not a subscriber, you ought to sign up right now. Go to standupwithpete.com, standupwithpete.com to learn more, or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic to sign up now. Okay. Well, I don't do the news on Fridays because I do do the hangout on Thursday nights, and I like to skip the news one day a week because I think that's good for me and probably good for you. So. Let's get right to my guests, shall we? Like I said, Kristen Finnegan, Ophir Eisenberg coming up. That begins at about 40 minutes in here. But let's kick it off right now with Celeste Headley. I highly recommend you subscribe to her newsletter, Here's a Thought. So brilliant. It does deep dives on one question, one issue, which I think are as good as it gets. You can learn more at CelesteHeadley.com. Follow her on Twitter and social media at Celeste Headley. She's the author of Three great books, all of which I mentioned right here at the top. She's also had a 20-year career in public radio. She's the host of several different shows, and you should learn more and subscribe and support everything that she's doing. Again, CelesteHeadley.com. Let's do it. Recording once, twice, three times a lady. You said it. Yeah. <laughs> Celeste Headley can sing. I knew that, though. You did. You yeah. come from a long line. Of, I, in fact, true. Yeah. You, you were trained. You're a trained singer. I am. I have a bachelor's and master's in vocal performance. That so. is what I, I, I was pretty sure that was true. What Your let's tax just, dollars at work. Let, let's uh, I wanted to mention a little. I want to start with a little uh, ass kissing to get to our first kind of topic here. But the thing that I really think is so impressive about you is that you are a real kind of utility journalist and author, meaning you can do anything. You can play any position as evidenced from, you know, the three big books that you wrote. One is about communication and why conversations matter. We need to talk. One is, I mean, I can't say which is my favorite, but I feel like this was really the most impactful to me personally. Do nothing. How to break away from overworking, overdoing and underliving completely different topic and book. And of course, most recently, your most recent book, speaking of race, why everyone needs to talk about race and how to do it. And what I want to ask you is, I'm pretty sure that your book, uh, Do Nothing, came out before Oliver Berkman's 4000 Weeks. And I've really been touting that book. I haven't had him on yet. I want to. But I feel like it was somewhat similar uh, to, to, to your book. And I wanted to ask you again about do nothing. And did that guy rip you off? I'm sure he did. I'm sure that he didn't. Um, I, <laughs> yes, his book is quite similar. I mean, when I went to start writing do nothing, which I did in 2017, uh, there were already books being written about the fact that we were overworked about burnout, about, you know, all of the issues related to, overwork. But I really wanted to get past sort of the symptoms that everyone was blaming, technology or bad relationships with managers or bad management, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what led, led me down years of research into evolution and the history of our labor practices going back to ancient Greece and all that. It was it was a lift when it comes to research. So reading Oliver's book, it 
it is quite similar in that it it's kind of following the same sort of path that mine did. Um, but you know, it's all good. It's well written. Uh, he's great. Uh, and I'm personally, I think that the more people who are spreading the message of let's not stop, by, you know, making our identities synonymous with our jobs. I think that's all to the good. So that's great. Know. That's great. And everybody should go get that book uh, for sure, because it's really I mean, that's certainly as timely and it will be forever given our culture, I think. But it's so helpful. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, I I kind of hope it's not timely forever and ever, forever, ever, well, yeah, forever. But, um, but yeah. yeah, it's likely that it'll be timely for longer than I'm alive. G- um, <laughs> yeah. Given, yeah. Given everything, you know, and research to write, do nothing. Uh, you know, it's you're pretty transparent about your life in terms of where you're kind of at, what you're doing. You were just invited to and completed three weeks at the Virginia uh, Virginia Center for Writing. What is it called? I just lost Center, it. Center for Creative Arts. Yeah. Very prestigious. Very cool that you did that. But you also have been sharing on one of your social media platforms uh, that I follow because I'm a big fan that you're 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 kind of you're toying with or you're you're designing. What's the word? The adjective. These little tiny model things. So you're doing art. Um yeah, there's one in the, in the shop yeah, there. You see it. Two, and three, four, five. Yep. And you're working on a new book and you're yeah. talking to me and you're it seems like you're super busy. So are you taking your own advice and it just doesn't look at, and it looks like that because I see all these things that you're doing? Yeah, because the miniatures I'm not those aren't work. Like I literally took up that hobby cuz I had no idea what I was doing. It's completely brand new to me. Um and so but that's, that's just, just something I just enjoy. You right, know, that I falls into watch. a not work that falls into doing nothing like the miniatures is a hobby like gardening yeah. is for me, maybe. Yeah. And, and gardening is mostly for me also. Yeah. Right. You know, like and I do garden, not in the middle of winter, but um, uh, yeah. So that's just one of my one of the things I do to not work and super enjoy myself, um, you know, do nothing that title is, was never meant to be literal. <laughs> I didn't expect anybody to go into a vegetative state. It just means do nothing that is connected to your job. If you don't have to right? like earn the money that you need for food, shelter, water, and, you know, support, and then go do something else. Right. <laughs> That's all that that meant. So, yeah, I, you know, the other thing I will say is that when you, I have found that the suggestions that I put in that book that are designed to sort of help people really put boundaries around their work. Um, if you follow those, you'll get your work done faster. You, you'll get stuff done faster and more yeah. efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, has that been for you? I don't know which the things when, have been most helpful for you. Yes. When I, well, when I, when I see you doing those things, sharing that you're doing those things It makes me realize that I have the time that I should be doing that, that I should be, you know, thinking about it. And so, yes, it it, it has. But I always have to keep getting reminded because I I, every day I'm I'm, I guess, fighting against the guilt of needing to produce to a certain extent. It's like I have to produce a certain amount to support my family within that. And, you know, it takes a lot to produce a daily podcast, as you have. Everybody knows much less everything else that I have responsibility for. So I'm constantly kind of fighting the guilt of when I'm not strapped to a screen, microphone, at camera, et cetera. But that's when what you wrote kicks in. So let me ask you about, since you just did that writing workshop, you do three weeks at this writing center. I mean, what was your, what was your media diet? What was your rules for yourself in terms of your relationship to digital? I mean, were you completely off in, in the wilderness? I mean, I couldn't, B, um, cause some of my work, as I was working on the book proposal for the next book, um, some of my work, you know, I save it in the cloud, right? I couldn't be completely off, but, um, it's in the mountains up above I- of the Blue Ridge mountains. Um, and the internet connection is not great. <laughs> right. So I knew go and I, and I did not bring a, you know, a portable mo uh, Wi-Fi with me. I did not ever use my phone as a mobile hotspot. Um, I just said that, you know, if it was slow and I needed the internet, I was going to slow down. You know, I didn't make any rules. Like for me, it would, it felt that to impose rules on what was going to happen during this residency, my first one I'd ever done 
would be to not to me to miss out on the big the biggest value of it, which was to to see if left to my own my body and mind's own devices, they would come up with a completely different pattern mm. to my day. And I did. <laughs> my my daily routine has changed dramatically. Oh, how so? As a result of that three weeks? Yeah. So you Just come back to quote your normal life and and what did you you brought things from that? Oh, yeah, completely. Huh. Yeah. I did, I I imposed no rules about when I would wake up, when I would go to bed. <laughs> I just left it all open. And so I'll tell you just a few things. First of all, they serve they have a every residency is different if you get a writers retreat or an artist retreat. This was for all different types of artists and different uh, media, but they serve breakfast from like I think seven thirty a.m. until nine or something, and then they serve dinner from like six to seven thirty, and then you go to your studio to work during the day, and they'll deliver a box lunch to the main kitchen there in the studios. So essentially, I was just like, okay, well, I'm not going to set any alarms. Um, I'm not going to go to bed by a certain time. Nobody's expecting me anywhere. I don't have to grocery shop or do dishes or anything. So I'm just going to see, I'll just sleep until I'm done sleeping and wake up and do what I feel like doing. So essentially I, what I found when I was doing there was I would get up, I would get up well before breakfast began. I'm an early riser. Always have been. I would do a, a morning yoga routine of like 15 minutes. I do my meditation. I'd write in a journal and then I, how long would, do you meditate on average? It, it depends. In the mornings, I do a 15 minute meditation. I do a meditation uh, before when I right when I get up and right when I go to bed. Oh, um, and then whatever I can do during the middle of the day. Those that's the one portion that didn't change that I brought with me and it remained the same. Um, but doing yoga first thing in the morning, like literally I would get out of bed, unroll my yoga mat and do yoga first thing. Uh, before I took out my mouth guard like immediately. <laughs> um, and I gotta say that has been kind of transformational. How? Like just, well, you know, I'm getting older, you know, I'm in my fifties now to get up and immediately stretch and start your day that way. Um, to go to right before you go to bed, stretching right before you go to bed has made me sleep better. Never done that in my life. I'm telling you, I never have either ever, <laughs> but it, it helped me sleep better. That's a hilarious, um, like I'm going to do it tonight, but it's also a hilarious <laughs> idea. Like just to, to visualize, like I'm going to bed, better stretch. Cause usually <laughs> stretching is preparing for activity and that's actually preparing for inactivity. And it makes total sense. Cause I have some issues too with my, my back, especially. Yeah. And they have all these wonderful yoga teachers online who will teach, oh, yeah. will give you a 10 or 15 minute evening routine, 10 or 15 minute morning routine. The other thing was that I have for a really long time, my, the morning has been my most productive period and when I've been most creative. And so I've stuck to that. Like that's what it was when I got out of college, when I first started my real jobs. Right. Hmm. But I've stuck to that my whole life, but it turns out that's nope. That's not true anymore. I don't know when it changed, but my mind is super busy in the morning and I just need to do all my other stuff. Just answer the email, do all those other things. And then I get start feeling like I can really buckle down and focus sometime around like 10, 10 30. And that has remained the same as well. So, you know, I just think that every once in a while, all of us, if we have that privilege and opportunity should find at least a couple days to throw our routine out. And see what happens when we're left to our own devices. Love it. That's great, great advice. And like you said, privilege and opportunity. If you get it, take it. Don't miss it. And and experiment and see what happens. I love it. And I love talking about this kind of thing with, with someone like you who's tried a lot and does a lot of research along with it and super curious and continues to at this point in your career and life. I love it. Uh, and you're always writing about these things and learning about them as well. I want to talk uh, with you about your most recent newsletter articles uh, as well. But I've got to t ask you just a couple other quick questions, which you certainly know a lot about. You've seen what's happened uh, recently with Scott Adams, the, the comic strip uh, Dilbert guy. And you tweeted about it, I saw. And you've also obviously, you know, you, you wrote a book about how to talk about racism. And I mean, it seems like in this case, I think you, you wrote something about like, this is some super 
overt, old school, blatant type racism. And I just I've asked a few people about it this week because I'm still trying to get different perspectives. Like, I don't know how to. It was so depressing is what I've been saying to see someone so overtly say that. I'm glad all these newspapers dropped him. He might be making more money now privately because he did that, which is the sad thing. But what do you how did you react to that? What do you say to that? How do we how do we move on or forward or comment about it? I mean, I find it interesting how racist you have to be to get dropped from syndicated <laughs> <laughs> from syndication. I mean, because he's been saying some really misogynist, racist yeah. crap for some time. I mean, look how bad it has to get uh, before people will <laughs> but will drop you. You know, I mean, there there is. A, I think I read some other blog where they were saying, you know, look, Al Cap um, was, you know, admitted to sexual assault and had all kinds of horrifying charges against him, and still maintained, you know, his. It still had his cartoon. He wrote, he drew and wrote, wrote little Abner and, and you know, oh, still had oh, okay. so many, his cartoon in so many newspapers. And, and, you know, so that's, this isn't a new phenomenon that it you really have to go over the line. I mean, I hate to, to quote him, but you know, remember Donald Trump was like, I could shoot someone on the streets of Manhattan or whatever. And people, I wouldn't lose their votes. That's sort of like what I thought of with Scott Adams is like, you know, this is how far you have to go. You have to be like David Duke of the KKK style racist before people were like, OK, that's that's enough there. I, I guess we don't want to associate with this dude. I mean, because let's be honest, Dilbert hasn't been truly funny. <laughs> I don't even have an opinion. I, mean, I don't think I've ever read it. it ever, and... You know, I mean, I, I thought there was some really funny stuff in the very, very early days. Hmm. It hasn't been for quite some time, you know, and so, you know. <laughs> I, I, you know, what can I say? He's been racist for a while, for years. He has been a misogynist for a very, very long time. He's dabbled in anti-Semitism. <laughs> you know, it just, this is what it takes, I guess. When we talk about racism often and increasingly, uh, you know, the, the polling data shows that a, a, a frighteningly large, sometimes majority percentage of white people, people who identify as white, also say that they are more discriminated against than than other people including people of color and it's basically what elon musk and said to his 120 million followers in reaction to scott adams basically saying yeah it's it's the media used to be against black people but now it's against white people how do you talk to somebody who a white person who thinks they're more discriminated against or discriminated against because they're white somehow so, I mean, the first thing I say is I don't ever argue with somebody um, about their about facts. Right. What I try to do when I'm uh, uh, presented with an opinion that's just completely and totally wrong is to focus on why why that's important to them. So, I mean, in that particular case, if somebody says talks to me about reverse racism, I'll say, well, listen, you know, uh, credible evidence shows reverse racism doesn't exist, but I'm interested in why that matters to you. Like, why do you, do you think that there is no damaging racism targeting black Americans? And of course they don't. Every, the vast majority of Americans, white or not, believe that it is harder for an African American to get ahead than others. And so I will say to that person, I'm say, if you think that, then reverse racism is a separate issue. Right. So we're here talking about the damage that's done after Americans. And you're trying to talk to me about the damage that's done to white people. Explain to me why you're making this shift. And I'll try to dig into that because you have to believe what people tell you about themselves. <laughs> and then arguing about facts is is useless. It's funny because I'm I was as we connected just before I was writing the next newsletter, which is about the ash conformity experiments. Do you remember those? Uh, uh, no. So um, I appreciate Sol the fact that you would give me any credit that I've ever even heard or learned about them. So Solomon Ash uh, in the 1950s um, was studying the limits, of the, kind of the boundaries of human conformity. Right. And so essentially he would bring in test subjects and he would show them a, a card that had th like three lines on it. And there was several that were about the same size. And then there's one that's clearly longer. Like there's no mistaking 
which is the longest line? And he'd say, which line is longest? And they'd say, number one. And he, was, he would say, yes, a hundred percent of people get it right because there's no mistake in it. Then he would surround them with people who were supposedly test subjects, but were obviously research assistants or something. And he would show them the same card and all those other plants would say, I think it's number two. And the 50% of the people would change their minds and they'd say, yeah, it's number two. Oh God. Like they, it's not that they were doing it just to please other people. They then had convinced themselves that the, the other line was shorter. I mean, think about that. <laughs> think about that. It's, it's both kind of fantastic in what our brains are capable of doing to us, but also horrifying because they couldn't even believe what they were seeing. And that's the same thing with somebody who claims to, to tell you about reverse racism. That's patently ridiculous. And, and most people can't even give you an example of when they've experienced it. I feel like it's so often people talk about racism, people who don't really think as much about it, but certainly people talk about it. They, they think about an interaction that they had with a person or how they were treated by a person of color. I'm talking about white people. When white people, if, if white people feel they are discriminated against, they'll talk about, I was passed over for a job. A black person was mean to me uh, and said it was because I was white. And those kinds of things happen all the time. People say things to people, mean things, horrible things, racist things all the time. But I don't think it's how I have ever thought of, uh, about it, because I always think more about systems and institutions and opportunity and so on. And, and I think of it as more of a kind of a cultural thing or a systemic thing or an institutional thing. And I wonder if that's if there's any way to meet folks in the middle I just I, I don't recall being in that conversation, but I'm like, yeah, OK, I understand that you this thing happened to you. But do you think overwhelmingly that black folks have more opportunity than white folks for, say, you know, education or, or health care or employment? And I and I kind of start there. And I don't know if that's effective or not, but I, I feel like I think so. I mean, I, you, what you're talking about is the difference between individual racism and and everyone can be racist to other people on an individual basis. I feel like basis. it matters to differentiate in the conversation. Yeah, as opposed to there's only one demographic that actually has the numbers and the power to impose its views and values on others to give itself advantages while disadvantaging others. There's only one. Um, and that's when you get in the systemic place. But yeah, I mean, when someone tells me about something that somebody has done to them that's really hurtful or painful, I will be, I will say, I will acknowledge the truth of their feelings. And I'll be like, I bet that really upset you. Yeah. And you know, how, how, well, how lucky for you, because now you can kind of get just a taste of what that must feel like for others. And that can give you some common ground to understand the complaints of other people who experience it every day, where it's not even a, 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 an occasional or even unique experience. It's all the time. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you to make that distinction between individual racism and every individual is capable of it. And the kind of racism that can actually hurt your life and make your mortgage more expensive. <laughs> yeah. That's a big difference. I, I, I feel like a lot of the same arguments or points can be made for sexism in general. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to another issue I certainly want to talk with you about. Uh, you, you wrote about compromise for Here's a Thought. And you wrote this piece around the time of the over who is going to be the Speaker of the House, Republicans fighting over that. And you did some good, re uh, some great research here about what it what it means. And, and you even you included that great uh, transcript of John Boehner being interviewed by Leslie Stahl in 60 Minutes, where she asked him about compromise, and he refused to say that word. He preferred common ground, because he made a good point, which is sad, but I thought it was kind of a good point. If I say compromise, my supporters are going to think I sold out, that I sold them out. And I was like, oh, that's why he doesn't like that word. It's He's probably not wrong about that, unfortunately. Uh, tell me your thoughts on why you wrote this and why it's so important, the, the idea of compromise, because you go pretty deep, and it's great. Yeah, you know, it, 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 I love that interview with John Bain, <laughs> um, which he did in 2010, where she keeps ta trying to get him to say the word compromise, as you say, and he just keeps. But I also you have to admire Leslie Stahl for continuing to go at it. Why won't you say 
compromise. You know, the majority of Americans, and by majority, I mean like three out of four, say it's really important for politicians to find compromise. That's opposed to standing on principle. You cannot both stand on principle and compromise. Impossible. And, and frankly, the most successful marriages occur between two people who know how to compromise and do not find it important to stand on principle. Right. And yet 60 percent of Americans say they don't think Congress is capable of that. I mean, think about that for a minute. They really don't believe that our our Congress people are have the capability, the ability to compromise and find a middle ground. You know, and, and I think one of the reasons I dug so deep into it is because it, on one level, that surpri- it surprises me that we're having so much trouble compromising. I mean, human homo sapiens, that's what we're built for. Like, that's how we survive. Right. You did some really interesting research on and explaining that. I thought that was fascinating and important. Yeah. Neurologically speaking, we are wired to cooperate with one another. Um, it, we have a social brain that um, I think the scientists in one study said it, our, our theory of mind allows us to predict what other people are going to do on the basis of what they like, what they believe. But we also have these mirror systems, these mirror neurons that help us understand what other people's goals are, what are their intentions, and then empathize with their emotions by what they call a a mechanism of motor resonance, right? And so there's all this incredible research, both sociological and neurological, going into our, our really superhuman capabilities when it comes to cooperation, collaboration. I think one person said that it was the the capacity for social cooperation is the lever that allowed the rapid ascent of human culture and civilization. I mean, that's deep. That's how deep that goes. So why? (laughs) It's also to me, it's also to me, to some extent, even when I was a little boy, to some extent, even though I was told differently through culture every day, it seemed obvious that that was the truth. Like it was like, I would think if we work together, it will get a, we'll, we'll have more success. And I, I feel better because I, I, someone's not trying to get me and somebody's not trying to constantly beat me. And I hated the idea of trying to constantly beat somebody else. And but yet I was told every day in so many ways that that that's how you had to be to succeed in anything. It's really unfortunate. And then you, you know, just they, go out they, and watch birds or fish or something You're like, I don't know. They, they seem to they they <laughs> test people using that marshmallow challenge yeah. all the time. Yeah. That's where they give you, you know, uncooked spaghetti and some marshmallows and tape. And they give you they tell you to create a structure using the tape and spaghetti. And um, the person who the team that wins is the one that builds the highest structure that can support a marshmallow, a full size marshmallow, not one of those mini marshmallows. And kindergartners regularly outperform the MBAs regularly. They're so much better at it because it's innate. It's instinctual in our species. Yes. It's, and the MBAs learned, have had it trained out of them. They've become right. competitive. And there are certainly obviously uh, cultures today and more primitive cultures, tribal cultures that still practice that. And even economic systems, uh, arguably. Yeah, one could say that socialism at heart is more about social collaboration and cooperation than, say, capitalism. Capitalism is built on on competition. Right. Right. And so, you know, some of this other research shows us, you know, we are able to look inside the heads of the the people who really resist change. I mean, not surprisingly, they tend to be politically conservative. That's sort of what conservatism about, is about, right? And, and I'm not being uh, dismissive or or in, insulting. I'm th- that conservatism is conserving. Like, you know, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? At heart, <laughs> that's not change if it doesn't need right. to be changed. But those who are the most resistant to change, they have a lot more activity in their amygdala. The amygdala is it's these two little almond shaped um, structures right at the top of your spine. Right. They hug the center of the brain. And the amygdala is is it's the oldest evolutionary part of our brain. It's like the remnant of a very, very old version of Homo sapiens. But it's it's activated and motivated by fear and threat. And so it is it's if you make someone feel afraid, they will resist change. They will cling to what is familiar and to their minds safe. And that explains a lot. Right. 
<laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I don't think I have an amygdala based on that. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. I am certainly motivated by by fear. That's for sure. In many different ways from a failure to lots of different ways. But I also do love change and yeah. uh, look forward to it in many ways and in and, and all ways. So lastly, I want to ask you just leading into this. I mean, you're always looking at data and science for all of your writing and reporting and journalism. And you're, I think, last two Newsletters are about studies. Here's uh, about science. Here's a thought about scientific studies. And the other one is titled. I don't remember the title. It's like a quick guide to reading them. Yeah. I just lost my place. Anyway. Yes. It, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah. To it. But, but one was like, here's a thought about scientific studies. The other one was about, here's a thought about reading scientific reports. Yes. Like, yes thank you. Sorry. I, I, I'm yeah. Sorry. No, it's totally okay. I've forgotten also, but like, yeah. What prompted that? Because I've been, I talked to Dr. Peter Hotez yesterday uh, about vaccines and about the study on masks that Brett Stevens misinterpreted in the New York times and caused a bit of a controversy. Um, and about all uh, the lab leak theory. And, and I was thinking spe- specifically with the lab leak theory, I, I wanted to use this example as a way to maybe set up what, what you're, what you're talking about here to some extent. Um, th- I, I tried to explore what my bias is about that. And I feel like I have a bias that says I, I, I don't want the scientific community to lose more credibility than maybe they already have. And so I want them to have been right about a thing. And maybe my bias is towards uh, the, the, the fact that most of the scientists I read and respect still think this occurred in, naturally in a wet market. Uh, but I also go, show me the evidence, as all the scientists are saying, and I'm open to changing my mind. But when I explored my bias, then I brought that to the scientists and asked them to explore theirs. And you've written all about this. How do you take a look at any of these issues and include your bias and try to add some critical thinking into it when you aren't, by the way, a scientist. Yeah, it's tough. And I, um, you know, we've already said I majored in music. (laughs) So when I uh, left, you know, college, I had no idea how to read a scientific report. I mean, we had to study acoustics and physics and anatomy when I was getting a degree in voice, but we didn't have to read any scientific reports. But when I became a journalist, I had to be re- reading them all the time. And it was it, th- what drove this this set of newsletters was that because the the journalistic coverage of many scientific reports is just horrifyingly bad. Like the journalists themselves are relaying bad information because they don't know how to read scientific studies because they're trying to create headlines that are clickbait and over 80% of people don't even read an article. They just read the headline. And so the, the first of the two newsletters was just, I was just trying to say, look, this is how bad this is. This is how different the results of a, a study can be when you actually look at it and not the news coverage of it. Um, and then the second one was like, okay, so, Absolutely. Anybody in the world who's literate can read scientific reports. Let me explain how to do it Um, the same way that I had to learn how to do it because it's important. And I think if if COVID taught us nothing, it's that it's really important that we learn a how to spot a credible source versus a not credible source and b how to read the science for ourselves. And it doesn't require that, you know, how to do math. I don't want to read the science for myself ever. I'll never get it right. (laughs) Like, I just want yes, you will. Really? Do you yeah. mean that? Yeah, I do mean that because because I have I start with the issue of I don't know who did this study and I don't know who funded this study. And I look at all kinds of reliable studies and research and I'm like, well, that looks good. And then I find out that it's bad. And so I have a, a, a several people and all kinds of different, I suppose, uh, sciences and medicines, several. And I. I see what they say because they are trained researchers and I am a comedian and I won't ever learn it. And I feel like my <laughs> bias is always going to be there. I'm always going to find a study that tells me what I want to hear. Cannabis solves cancer. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, look, that's absolutely the case. Plus the nature of science is that it's changing all the time. That's the whole point, right? Yes. Um, luckily, there's usually really credible people who have already done that work for you. Right. They've already written the responses and the reviews of journal articles. Most journals have a section where 
people are reviewing other people's studies. Right. Um, and so you can see the responses to, to other people's work and you don't have to do it all on your own. But I mean, finding out that other stuff about who funded it and how it was, how it was done. That's so easy, right? That's literally just going to the method section of a scientific report and saying, wait, they did this experiment for 10 days on nine people. Yeah, but I'm, I'm gonna... still going to be convinced by the study, even if I figured that out and I felt comfortable with that because, um, because it's a study and I didn't, I didn't do it. And then when I find out uh, from a researcher, it's like, yeah, the sample size was shit. I'm like, well, I didn't know yeah. that. I don't know any, sh- I don't know even about sample size. <laughs> well, okay. I guess for you who have the, the opportunity to talk to really, really smart people like me in who are experts in their fields, I, I'll give you a pass. I'll say, well, give you know, a, you don't I, have to read it. I, but you don't, but I feel like you don't like, I feel like if you read, like, I feel like I have a lot of trust in Dr. Aaron Carroll on science or, or Dean Baker on, on economics, because a lot of the things that they have said and predicted and been nuanced about have been true or somebody else on foreign policy, even that's not a science or even because they're so often, they say a thing's going to happen and then it does happen or they say a thing's not going to happen and it doesn't happen. I'm like, I'll go to the guy who predicted the housing bubble burst. I'm, I'm going to go back to that guy. I'll go to the guy who said, you know, this was going to happen if you did this. And I feel like that's not that. Di- I feel like that's the easy cut for, for, an idiot Maybe, like me. Maybe, except that's the thing, is that there's no such thing as a scientist who's never wrong. How like, dare if you? you find a scientist who's never wrong, they're <laughs> Jordan not... Peterson. <laughs> Uh-oh, we lost Celeste. She actually, <laughs> she passed away. Is he a scientist? I think he might have some kind of a degree. I don't he's know. a psychologist. Jordan I was trying Peterson to think of the most odious of, of people. Yeah, he's odious. Um... Absolutely odious. And you but will he... always find scientists and degreed people with MDs and PhDs that will say something they don't believe to make a buck. That's the history. I feel like, uh, who was it? Who wrote that book, uh, Fantasyland? Kurt, uh, I'm, th- I'm blanking on his name. But like that's happened for like the last 500 years. You'll always find people that str- uh, present themselves as credible and maybe their degree is, but they are 100% grifting. And, and, not, and even more so, somebody who's not grifting still can be wrong sure. i mean the whole point For of sure. an experiment yes. is to test a, a question better point, better point. Yes. right yep. like i have this question i wonder what happens here and the the this the best scientific studies really are open questions right because a scientific study becomes biased when you try to steer it in a certain way so the best design studies leave it completely open and they have as good a chance of failing as not so, you know, that's the most exciting science to me is the one where somebody says, wow, we predicted this, but look what happened. Look what happened. It was yep. the opposite of what we thought. It was very different from what we thought. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, people need to understand that, that that's the whole point of, of science is asking questions that you don't know the answer to and allowing the evidence to speak for itself. Very well said. I'll let you go, but we have to end on a fun one. I should have told you this ahead of time. Very unoriginal, but still, good way to always end. Uh, what you're reading, what you're watching, or what you're listening to. You could do all three if you can rip them off quickly. I don't want to, but you could also just pick one, because I know you're uh, a musician who's constantly listening to music. I know you're a writer who's constantly reading. I don't know about your watching habits and anything about your watching habits of television or film or anything else, but so I'm a member of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, and so I am watching all the nominated films. Oh, look which at is you! A very bleak you remember- slate because I got an order, I got a vote for the SAG Awards. Um, so that is why I'm watching right now. I am reading uh, Eric Foner's Short History of Reconstruction. Uh, that is for the next book, the book proposal that I am writing right now, and it's an incredibly good. I mean, it's a, it's older. It, this is the revised edition. Um, and then uh, what I am listening to, I actually just got tickets to the Drive By Truckers <laughs> uh, concert here in uh, DC, and so I've been listening to Drive By Truckers. What genre of music are the Drive By Truckers? The Drive By Truckers, they are an incredibly good. Uh, I mean, I think you'd call them rock band, but influenced by sort of like folk and country sounds, maybe a little bit of uh, bluegrass. I think most of the members are from northern Alabama. Has um, has I'm going to go look them up and listen to them. Has 
uh, anything about COVID changed the way that you would go to see a live performance? I mean, I wear a mask. You'll wear That's, a mask to a live. Yeah, performance. I'll wear a mask. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if but, I'm going to be seated close to people, I'll wear a mask. But you're, but you're still, uh, but you're going. And I think that yeah, I'll go a lot yeah, more I'll, than, than a lot of people could say. I always get a little weird about going into huge, you know, audiences uh, next to people. Rather, if I'm doing that, I want to be on stage. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, oh, absolutely. And I do give speeches in person, but as you say, I'm, I'm a good 20 yeah. to 50 feet away from the right. next person. So you feel you're doing safer. all the spitting as opposed to being the <laughs> That's how I say it. That's a that's a good motto for life. Uh, Be the yeah. one spitting and not spit on. Thank you, Celeste, <laughs> as always, for talking to me. I, you're just one of my my favorite people to talk to, to read, and uh, I am so grateful. Thank you. Oh, that's really kind. Thanks so much, Pete. Thanks for having me. Yeah, there she goes, everybody. Celeste Headley. CelesteHeadley.com. Get all of her books and subscribe to her newsletter and support her in all ways. So happy to have had her back on the show. And now it's time to get to my second segment my second guests they are comedians christian finnegan and ophira eisenberg who are the best individually and even better as a trio love talking to them haven't had them all uh, all three of us together in a while but we did it and i thought it was great go to new music for old.substack.com and subscribe to christian's amazing thought-provoking hilarious and interesting newsletter which gives you all kinds of new ideas about music. Check that out right now. Also, go subscribe to Ophira Eisenberg's podcast, Parenting is a Joke. Watch their specials. Two of the most veteran, seasoned, credible, hilarious stand-up comedians I know. We had a meandering conversation covering a lot of ground. I think you'll enjoy it. I always love talking to them, especially right here at the top when we learn Christian's secret warm-up exercise before his performances that apparently he hasn't done in a long time, but he certainly did nail here at the top. Christian Finnegan, Ophira Eisenberg. Oh, Finnegan. Let's do it. Yeah, sorry. I'm in the podcast studio at QED, and I was here oh. waiting for Cameron to come relieve me, and that's why I couldn't get her to 345. I go all the way home, and then I find out that my microphone is actually back here at QED, so I had to then run back. Oh. Because I want... I want your listeners to get peak Finnegan sound quality, Pete. I understand that peak Finnegan, peak, peak Finnegan. Finnegan sound quality. I'm rolling on it right now. Do you want to? How do you generally like to do a test for peak PFQ? Fleeing sheep, honorary constable. Ooh. Those are old speech exercises from my NYU days. Do you have any Ophira that you do? Do you honestly do a thing? I, I I'm a pee popper, so I always have to do Peter Piper pack a pack pack a pick killed pep. Per Prozac. What is it? Peter right. Piper Pack? Uh, I can tell you. Uh, Peter Piper, the pickle pepper picker, picked a peck of pickle peppers. A peck of pickle peppers did Peter Piper, the pickle pepper. Pickle pepper picker pick. Now, if Peter Piper, the pickle pepper picker, picked a peck of pickle peppers, where is the peck of pickle peppers that Peter Piper, the pickle pepper picker, picked? I've been searched. <laughs> I wish your listeners could see the just completely <laughs> stunned faces. We didn't know that was coming. I wow. know. I, I should have warned you. How I, I often do you rehearse that? <laughs> that I, I haven't said that in probably 15, 20 years. That is. But, but uh, it just came to you? Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Just, important wow. people who could help my career. Can't remember their names, but that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so, I, wow that was impressive that was, i don't have anything who who said that going to tish wouldn't reap rewards true that's but tish thank you tish Cooley Cooley the most prestigious in the country arguably the most prestigious tongue twister academy in these united states so my husband also went to tish and his parents mortgaged their house to send him there I'm so sorry. The fuck? Doesn't look like it bothers you at all, though. The inheritance that you're not going to get. <laughs> Do they have any regrets? Does he have any regrets about that? We shouldn't talk about him. No, no, I think they're all fine. I mean, I think in the end of the day, uh, Jonathan thought that because he went to film school, you know, that it was great, but like maybe he could have gone to film school somewhere else that was less expensive and it still would have been OK. I think that's his general. I don't mind. Like, I don't mind saying that's literally the argument that we're having with Ava 18, who's applied to NYU film USC. And I've just asked her to talk to 
you know, and I'll add Jonathan to the mix of people who have done that. I'm like, listen, I'll support your pursuit in the arts. I would be a hypocrite not to, but I feel like spending a whole bunch of money on a degree in a thing that you would do better just to actually do film or a lot of other, you know, art forms as well. Do you guys, and everybody I talk to in film or has gone to film school generally agrees with that. And I, it's a, kind of become a little bit of a divisive thing and I don't want to argue about it anymore. What, I don't know how to handle it. I'm going to say the most, and the, Christian, you can like double down on this because you actually have the experience. But the one thing I will say, which I don't have for my degree, even though I went to McGill just because I took anthropology, is, you know, anyways, is that like Jonathan's friend was Eli Roth. Like he, his peers in that, um, his class are people who are really working in the field. So the idea, and that's what I hear from a lot of actors and stuff that went to NYU is that you're peers are people you end up working with in the industry and they're real. That That is, that is true. And uh, I will also say that like your professors, like the people who teach you are working professionals, you know, like right. uh, r I took a nonfiction writing course with Robert Christgau, who's like one of the most famous rock critics in music history. Uh, it, you know, I, I had an acting class with William H Macy for a year, you know uh, it's that's, you know, that's the kind of thing you're not going to get at, you know, SUNY Oneonta. I, uh, yeah, no, so Sunny who you know, it, it matters. By the way, that's, I went to school just beneath SUNY Oneonta. That was not personal. Uh, it felt like it was. <laughs> felt like you knew exactly what you were doing. Uh, <laughs> by, I interviewed uh, William H. Macy. He's a real son of a bitch, huh? Real mean bastard. Uh, what, what do you mean? I'm joking. Are you he, joking was like, he was like over the top nice and well, polite. He's incredibly nice, oh, really? today, okay. but it's just like it's Thank a God. weird time, you know, given his uh, his and his wife's recent. Uh, oh, legal not, he, he had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I mean, can, if you can believe that, I, just, <laughs> I refuse to believe that he would do anything. And also, um, it's like like he was a, a fantastically sweet man and yeah. a great teacher. And you know, from he wasn't a massive star at the time. It was but it was before Fargo came out, which was kind of what really broke him as like a major actor. Um, but he was mm -hmm. still a guy who I was aware of. But you know, he he worked. I went to an acting studio that was started by him and David Mamet, and so I had Mamet kind of pumped into my veins for four years as being like wow. a genius. And now I have, let's say, shall we say not entirely positive feelings towards Tape and Mamet. Right. And so it makes me question everything. Well, <laughs> well, is it, is it true? Well, though, that's where we're at. Is it, yeah. is it true that who, you know, matters as much as, as what, you know, in every profession, it's certainly the case in comedy and in entertainment. I think it's pretty hard to argue otherwise, but isn't it also the case as a union bricklayer or the, you know, the choo-choo train driver, the, the engineer, like you, you get that job because someone, you know, is in that job. And that's, you know, is it true? My all dad was a choo-choo driver. Right. His dad was a choo-choo driver. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> or that his dad. At a certain I mean, point, I th we're I think, yes, I, I also think that, uh, yes, I don't know. I, I th that's like my one argument. I will never go back in time and go to private school, nor will I afford that for my child. But there is, I always find that there's these just groups of people who tend to lift each other up that all know each other from a educational edu I, uh, institution. But I also so it's not just who be, you know, it's like summer, that they, summer camps. <laughs> they all went to the same, like everybody, yeah. everybody yeah. famous went yeah. to the same summer camps. Well, it's really I, I, disconcerting. I, I think that the, the barriers to entry are pretty obvious and uh, the, those doors are, That's right. are opened at something. But I, but I guess the, I said who, you know, and, and, and what, you know, but I have always believed for me, as much as anything, it was where I literally put myself. Like the best thing I ever did for my comedy career was to hang out at stand up New York every night when I did not want to. And I didn't have a set. And I just, that's where I met everybody. And that's where I watched I was, everybody. I've never been good at that. I've never, that's like the part I, of comedy that I've I just hated been it. the worst about. I think it's hard, especially, but I, you know, I didn't even drink when I first started. So it was like even, but the point is oh. like, wouldn't Ava, wouldn't my daughter have almost as easy of a time, like hanging out in the West Village with NYU students, <laughs> film school. But how do you do that? They would just be like, why is that weird person you make that films. doesn't go you to go school and you hanging? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I don't even know, honestly, at this point, what film school is like, and I'm sure there's an yeah. answer. I just don't know what it is. It's, it's like, you know, with technology having advanced so much and yeah. so much of this information being accessible, you know, that's a, yeah, I, I don't know. Right. I mean, I'm sure that there are, there are answers, but uh, but I don't know what they are. So I would never like when I started stand up, I would never tell someone to take a class just because at the time I felt like people who took classes, you were like, oh, A, you're being scammed. And yes. B, if you're any good, you don't need a class. But now, uh, now everyone takes classes. And I realize part of that is the barrier to entry. Like it is so hard to figure out how to get yourself on stage. It is so hard if you don't have like unbelievable self-esteem maybe, or just yeah. even you can't put it together. And so that's where you start going, take a class. It's like you're it's like a runway. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like training wheels and it's uh, the accountability of your peers and the sort of knowledge that like, oh, I have this thing coming up in three weeks that I'm getting ready to do, you know, and having deadlines and having other people that are expecting you to be somewhere. You know, I, I, I agree. I've gone through the same, you know, uh, process when it comes to classes. And I do think that most classes are a joke. I don't think a class can make you a funny, a good comic. I think it can save you 18 months. A good a good stand up class can save you some time by sort of getting you past having to just like walk into open mics and not know anything. It can kind of help you uh, just get through a few of those early stumbling blocks quicker, I think. Yeah, it's like driving. You could take a driving course and learn a whole bunch of things and that would be helpful. Or you could drive for like a couple of years and you might have a few (laughs) accidents, but you'll learn from every stupid thing that you do. Yeah. And I think that's true. Oh, so right red means my... stop. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not in every country. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> it is? Um, <laughs> North I was, Korea. I was reading that there is like a massive decline in just people taking humanities courses yeah. in general. It's just almost like the idea that being an English major is almost done. What is that? Yeah, I, mean, I saw that exact discourse going on. I think yesterday yeah. on on Twitter yeah. about yeah about English majors and the death of the English major. And yeah, I think there was a an op ed that was written uh, that kind of started the conversation. Is that a direct correlation Correct. as to why we have less humanity in our in our lives in our discourse and in our <laughs> no? But what I mean, do you mean? Yes, think to a degree, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in this Make article, I don't remember. Huh? Sorry. Make the case. I, I don't remember who wrote this op-ed that I'm, that kind of got this conversation started, but it was making the rounds yesterday, and uh, I, I haven't read it, so I'm talking slightly out my ass. But uh, but I think that you know the humanities have you know education has a purpose other than just what your career is going to be. That you know, call me crazy. I think reading books, you know, about other cultures and other times or reading uh, philosophical, you know, philosophical treatises from the 17th century or whatever. I think that can help your life, even if you end up being an account rep for, you know, Moderna or whatever. I I, I still think it has relevance to living as a human being. Absolutely. I I mean, I I would say it taught me it's a weird thing. This sounds like I am the most privileged person, even though I paid for it was student loans. Maybe that's privilege, too. Um, But I felt like I went to college to learn how to think. That sounds so stupid. But seriously, that's what I got out of it. I didn't know how to critically assess things. I really was like I didn't know how to read stuff and uh, process it, how it uh, reflects on today. And that's what I feel like I ended up getting out of my degree, which I loved. What if I just said to you, though, you're 18 years old, Instead of college, I'm going to fund a two year trip across the the world. And at each at each country, you you stay for a month and you find work. That's it. Amazing. You're basically yeah, amazing. You're, you're, you're arranging an, an amazing race for your own child. It's essentially. Yeah. With a ton of work visas. Yeah. And uh, how about that? Is that not get... is is that not a equal or better education? Um, probably. I, just, I don't know. I don't I, I mean, it's hard for me to say. The answer is yes. I don't know where, but as long as you have, you still have those people that you hang around and go like over the summer, does everyone want to like smoke weed every day and like read all of Shakespeare? Like you need those people still Mm -hmm. for sure. You'll find them on a beach in Thailand. (laughs) I I don't know. No, I think I'm sorry. You can create a quad in your own backyard. I'm like, for all of my nephews are just taking tech. That's if they like that, that makes it like I just think, you you know, my dad told me just pursue a job you like, for God's sake. 
because he didn't like his job. He that's all he wanted. And I told him I want to do comedy. He's like, fine, you're funny. Go ahead. And that was great. But I, I mean, for my daughter, like right I mean, now, it would have been better if he was honest with you. But that's probably. What do you I think? I, I, what do you think? If he was more people. honest, what do you think he would have suggested I do? I don't know. Head polisher. <laughs> you thought <laughs> not even a, it's not really a thing that anybody does. I don't think though. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. There's a good living in it. <laughs> I don't know where you got that out of. All he did was look at my face and come up with that jaw. He just he was so, on, man. so cruel. I mean, all I can think of is uh, Elmer Fudd getting his uh, head massaged in that, uh, you know, Barbara of Seville uh, car- car- Thank cartoon. Thank you. Oh my got the, I, I love could, how you know the name of the cartoon and everything. And I couldn't imagine we how that was going to get worse for me. <laughs> uh, Ava, Ava might go to, she got into Ithaca and I, I, my oh. thing is like, my thing is like that town is a really interesting town and Cornell is there and I mean, like, what an amazing experience it would just be to live in work in Ithaca, much less go to school in Ithaca. It's so beautiful. It's it's bucolic, which is a word I've been using quite a bit. And I mean, I so badly want her to go there. It's not up, apparently it's not up to me. No, I, I and I totally understand your perspective and I agree with it. And if I had things to do over again, knowing that I was going to end up living in New York City, I so truly wish I had lived somewhere else for college. Like mm. I wish I had four years of experience living somewhere else yeah. so that it wasn't just all New York from the age of 18 on. Right. I, uh, that's you know, exactly what I, I did that. I did try t- to tell a teenager that, though. Well, you know, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. You're absolutely right. I did two years in upstate New York. And then I met a whole bunch of people from New York that got me ready for New York. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like yeah. I came from a rural white Christian, you two, Dave Matthews town hunting. And I went and there was Jewish people and there was black people and Hispanic people and a lot of all of them. And they weren't like anybody I grew up with. And I was then when I moved to New York, I was, I was like not shocked by culture yeah. nearly as much right. as I would have been. It's a great transition for me, I think. Yeah, I mean, Montreal and Toronto were my middle points because, right, I grew up in Calgary where I was different. And then, uh, (laughs) yeah, and then moved to Montreal and I was like, oh, there's people speaking different languages and not just French. It's, you know, okay, it was it's a very diverse place. And then Toronto, too, very diverse. But Calgary to New York would have been. Well, I know because I see sometimes my family and friends travel here and they are intimidated. They're completely intimidated. By anything in particular? Well, just, you know, it, it will start like this. And this is how I know. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a really interesting experience for you. They'll say, we're staying in Midtown. Do you have any restaurant suggestions in New York? And I'm like, any restaurant suggestions <laughs> in New York? They're like, yeah, for brunch. I'm like, do we want to go with a type of food? Do we want to go with a neighborhood? No, like, what are your they, favorite they can't breakfast places in New York? Because in a lot of cities in this country, and we've all been to them, you can see the city know, from miles three. away. It's I an would, eight block like circle. I feel like that if someone, city. I don't live in, in New York anymore. Nobody would ever, I mean, every once in a while people ask me, I'm like, I haven't lived there for a long time. I don't know where to eat. But if someone asked me that now, I'd say, oh, you know what? Let me have your phone. And I would take their phone and I would just download an app. Like whatever you're going to put it all in the app. Tell them what you want. You want this atmosphere, this type of food, this type of price. It's going to give you five places in the neighborhood you want. What the hell am I supposed to do? I know that's what I say. It was like, well, they want the want inside spend? scoop from, from I don't have the actual, inside scoop for anything yeah. on anything. You know, you know what I ended up doing? Cause I was just so like, how do I, I don't want to um, insult these people to the point where they think I'm rude because you can come off just as like, Oh yeah. yeah. Cause I literally started by saying, just go in anywhere. It's going to be fine. Avoid the chains going anywhere. And then I thought, you know what? Forget it. And I was like, here's a breakfast place. And like, I just threw out five places all over the place. Tribeca, Upper West Side. <laughs> like, I was like, there they are. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, what what kind of person uh, comes from the Midwest or, or somewhere else and then goes to a chain in New York or what kind I of understand. American goes to Italy and eats? In I a, understand it. I understand it. Go I, ahead. My, safe my safety? very first night living in New York when I went to college, uh, I me, my new roommate who I just met that day and a guy who I knew from high school who also was going to NYU. We all went to McDonald's and it was like we just needed a life buoy. We needed some sort of like familiar <laughs> setting because it was just all so fucking overwhelming, you know? So it was just like, I know what a Big Mac is. 
So, I mean, I, I kind of get it on some level. Yeah. All right. If, I mean, if you say so, but a family comes to New York from Michigan. And yeah, I mean, go- there's only so much stimulus people can take. There's only so much new people can take in a 24 hour period. And so I think sometimes it's just like, all right, we're in this strange place. We're uncomfortable. We've been walking all day, which we don't normally do. Everyone is constantly telling us to get out of the way because we don't know how to walk on sidewalks or whatever. Let's just go to Olive Garden. Because I, just, I would there not have we seen feel like we I, know would, we're doing. I would not have seen your defense of these people coming from a mile away. I don't know you. I, you must think well, I'm this, some sort of elitist, Pete, when I clearly am. sure I, I do. <laughs> I think New York, uh, people who run businesses in New York know what's going on. And I always feel like as someone who lives here, and it's apparent to me again, a lot of New York is not for me. It is for tourists. It's so clear. Mm-hmm. It's not for me. There yeah. are neighborhoods that are not for me. They're mm-hmm. for tourists. And when I'm in those neighborhoods, I'm like basically gaming how to get out because I go, oh, yeah, this is not for me. Is that true of Bro- Brooklyn and Queens? Um, to a far lesser degree, to a far, a far yeah. less. I mean, Brooklyn, I think more than, than Queens. Um, I mean, yeah, Queens has always been few- kind of a residential borough, you know, so. Okay. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask Ophira about her one person show. Are we calling it that? Leaving a Mark, a comedy about scars. You did several performances, none of which I attended because I don't care about anybody. And Christian cool. uh, was on stage with you one night. Uh, tell folks, well, uh, storyteller, stand up and longtime NPR trivia show host, Ophira Eisenberg, shares the stories behind the scars on her body in a darkly comedic solo show about beauty, harm, and healing. Audience members with their own scars may be called upon to share their own stories in exchange that we hereby dub, what is it? Sisatrix of the Trade. That's the Time Out New York review. And my question to you is why are you such a hack? That old story. Why do I? Why do I have to do the same? Talk about the same stuff everyone's talking about, right? Why so unoriginal? Why bring the <laughs> audience into it? Christian told me about it when you were weren't here one time, and he just talked about it uh, on on the show, and it just sounded great. How was the experience? It's such a great idea for a show. Everybody in the audience has some type of a scar. Uh, how did it go? Are you happy? Are you going to keep think, doing it? Yeah, I think it went well. I, you know, I honestly, Christian, Christian did. I, so I did half the shows with a special guest like Christian who did the best job of it and then half just without it. Um, mostly because there was a time crunch. So I had to be economical with what I had to work with, but it was, it went better than I thought it would. People showed up all those things that I feared. Uh, but also I thought it was much more emotional than I thought it would be. I love talking to the audience. The audience every night came with, wild stuff mm. just wild stuff like what and i like everything from a lot of like a lot of my brother threw me out of a car when i was 12 there's that there's a woman that uh said um i just remember looking up at a full moon because i was driving through i think she was in um tanzania and we got in a car accident and i rolled out of the jeep and it was at night and i knew my face was uh, messed up and i thought I'm going to die. And she was there. Uh, and her face wasn't that messed <laughs> up, but she had scars. And then there was people, there were people who like, you know, I was like trying to open up a stereo speaker with a butter knife and you know, the torque of it, I just like clawed myself oh. in the face. Yeah. I um, think that's what's so, what's so great about the the premise of, of going into the audience is because you're going to get the whole range yeah. emotionally. You're going to get the, like, I had this horrible thing that I've overcome and you're going to get, I was a fucking doofus. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Out of each. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and then everybody, I put little notes on people's table. If they wanted to write about their scar, just to leave or to keep a bunch of people I know were like, I wrote it and decided to keep it for myself. Okay. Weird. I didn't, I actually didn't even think about that, but I have a stack of them. And yeah, people just wrote out like wild things that have happened to them. And I, I, that's to me, like, I love doing the show and I love telling my story and he, and just feeling like it has some resident uh, resonance with people. I loved interviewing someone because it was a totally different perspective and a deeper perspective. 
And then the audience thing just reminds, I just wanted to remind everyone that we're all just walking around each other. I love it. You know, what happened? Yeah. Nothing I, ever it, happened. It, is the goal to continue <laughs> doing it? That is the goal. Yeah. The, the goal is to come back bigger and better, baby. Well, I'm really excited for you. It's a, it's a great idea. Everybody should see it wherever it lives. You're now off to, she's off to Austin, Christian. She's going to uh, South by Southwest. Look at this. I hear that's a very, very, very hip town. I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you been there, Christian? Of course, yeah. It's, it, it, it is a fun. It is a fun town. I would imagine it's probably less fun now than it was 15 years ago. Now that the all of the Rogans and Elons of the world have have flooded in, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, no, it's it's a great town. What was your experience? What were, were you were doing gigs? Did you do South by Southwest? I've never done South. I was supposed to do it one year, but then I had to cancel because uh, uh, yeah, they don't make it easy. Uh, I did Moon Tower. They don't uh, make it easy. No, um, I did. I did Moon Tower, which is a big festival one year, and I played Cap City a couple times. And uh, and also, I did a travel web show for uh, a weird thing like eight or nine years ago, and we spent like five days in Austin going to like cool, weird places in Austin. That was fun. Cool. Were they cool yeah. and weird? They were cool. They were so weird, man. Keep Austin weird. <laughs> 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 that, I wonder, that's slogan. and Ophira, have you spent time there before or anywhere else in Texas? Because oh, that's not really as, I, as Texas-y as... Yeah, I did I did some shows, uh, this is a few years ago, in San Antonio, Dallas. I did it all, a big, big group in Dallas. No, that was Houston. It was all Jewish women in Houston. And I will tell you, they were the blondest Jews I've ever all seen of, in my uh, life. I'm, I misheard <laughs> all of the Jewish women in Houston were there? Well, I don't know. I, there was a lot of women there, so there was like nine hundred. I don't know all of them, but they were very blonde and very put together. Mm. I was like, "Wow, all right." And Austin, you know, I will tell you this is sort of a dark memory. But the last time I was in Austin, I was uh, pretty emotionally messed up because my mother. It turned out it was a month before she would die, but she was very sick, and, and I was doing comedy like a robot that didn't know when to stop. And I went to a bar and so I was just watching people um, dance, like doing like two step, like dancing, which I don't know how to do that dance. And some elderly man asked me to dance and I just went, OK. And I was uh, and he just whisked me all over the place and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I can kind of follow if I let myself go. And then he was he was clearly frustrated with me because I wasn't so very good. <laughs> but uh, and then he was like, OK, thanks. And I just walked away and I just remember my friend who was with me was just looked at me and went, did you just say yes to someone who does that? I was like, I guess I did. I love that story. It's adorable. It's very sweet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that man's name was Jonathan. And now they're married. Yeah. Elderly man. My (laughs) husband. Uh, Where is, so check Ophir out South by Southwest. Uh, I know we have some listeners down there. Shout out to Isaac Oster. I know he's down there off the top of my head. Cornell. You're by a Hotel St. Cecilia. That's where we're doing events with iHeart. Uh, Christian. On Saturday night. With what? iHeart? iHeart Radio? Yeah. Oh, cool. Are you doing a show down there? Are you doing your podcast down there? I'm doing my podcast and uh, sort of doing like a chat part Mm -hmm. of my live chat podcast on Saturday night and then uh, just booking some comedy around it, I think, earlier in the day on Saturday, which turns out during the festival, you know, you can do a 4 p.m. show. That's legit. I mean, honestly, uh, there's about six weeks. There's about six weeks that there's not a festival going on in Austin. There's (laughs) festivals all year round. Uh, One of the, I think that's uh, probably a good place to live then. A lot of festivals is probably a good thing. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I always say to people traveling to New York when they're like, why is a bottle of water $2? I'm like, because it's never not a festival. (laughs) Uh, What is a city or a place that you've never been to that you really want to go to or that you'd like to go back to? Christian, because I've to never been vi- to Austin. Yeah, That's as a one- tourist or as a comedian. Oh boy, I if you could split it if you want. Well, I'm going to Iceland next month. <gasps> yes, no. for the big, mm-hmm. the big five zero. Yeah, big five zero. Um, cool. Yeah, Iceland turns fifty, and I'm going to go celebrate it. Oh. Now, uh, yeah, I'm going to Iceland, so that will definitely tick a box for me um, as far as it being a comedian goes. Uh, I've always, there's this festival that goes, uh, I think, uh, Alaska Before You Die, 
which uh, just announced their lineup last week. It's called like Alaska B before you die. Uh, I'm... and I thought like, God damn, I wish I had known like that would be kind of a fun thing to do. Just completely off the grid in Alaska just to do comedy up there. I hear it's a raucous crowd based on uh, my, that old episode of insomniac that I saw where he's in Alaska. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So there's my answers. Good answers. I was booked to do a gig in Alaska and my dad was going to go with me and I had to cancel it and I forget why, but it was for something, a really good reason. And they were pissed at me really <gasps> hard to get, you know, comic book up there, I guess. Mm. And yeah. uh, I mean, I gave him more than adequate notice. So I, I was like, whatever, but, but uh, I never ended up going. That would have been a, a really fun trip. Maybe someday. Uh, what about you, Ophira? Do you have a, a place that you, I, the- you know what? Yeah. I, I, after high school, I spent a year traveling around as you were suggesting to your daughter, uh, all through Australia and the South Pacific, but I've never been back to perform. And obviously like Australia is a great comedy scene. I would love to see what that's like. I would I like have to hang spent out a in lot of time performing in Australia or what in okay. one year. I, I did the Melbourne international festival for two yes. weeks and then I went back and I did what they call the road show, which is where they send groups of comedians out. It's like sponsored by the government and they send them out to various parts of Australia. So I spent a month going through Western Australia and the Northern territories, oh, like little awesome. tiny map. And towns. it was awesome. I mean, it was weird being with a bunch of people who like, I didn't know and, and all that, but it was, uh, it was, a, I'll never forget it. It was a super awesome experience. Be How did your there. comedy go over with a small mining town in Western Australia? <laughs> well, you know what? Those crowds were like unbelievably thankful that you were there. Mm-hmm. Like, there would literally be dudes in like dusty miner suits in the audience. You know, they'd come straight yeah. from, cause that's where all the minerals are mined out in Western Australia. And so there'd just yep. be some dude in a bright orange jumpsuit sitting in the front row, <laughs> uh, like covered with dirt. Um, so they, they treated you like you were like, like liberators. Yeah. Uh, so I don't remember See, those where the, the material went. But. Those are the comedy shows I want to put together. I don't want to put together shows in populous places. I want to put together like the, the gratitude tour where they're just so <laughs> happy you came to town. They don't care. I love all of that. That's a, those that, yeah, I never really think about it. That I can't even remember like feeling that way about, about a gig. They were so happy. Some of the colleges you would do, I suppose they were pretty happy. You would, you would be at those, mm-hmm. by the way, recently I said to somebody, uh, you know, somebody said, have you ever had, you know, is your conscience clear about your past or something like that? I'm like, you know, I'm a stand-up comedian who in my early twenties performed at over 300 colleges and universities and I had no allegations against me. And that's something I should get an award for because there was, I was told by my agent at the time, don't be in the room with a, with a young college student alone. And, and I was, I just remember thinking it's not about me being a good person. It's like, I want to continue to work. Like these are such lucrative gigs at that point in your career. I want to continue to work. And yet a lot of comedians for sure did a lot of bad things on those campuses as, as we know. <laughs> and I don't know if that I brings us. I remember going to one of those NACA conferences, which yeah, is that's what, yeah. Know, oh, yeah. national act, student activity, whatever it's called. Uh, and uh, Mr. Be- after, after the festival, there was like a bar, a hotel bar where everybody was hanging out and Mr. Belding was there. That's right. That's from right. From Saved by the Bell. I too met and, him at one of those. Yep. Yeah, and a few people implied that maybe he had a, a reputation for uh, taking some liberties. <laughs> I mean, wow. he's building. His, wow. A lot yeah. of fantasies about wanting to sleep with your principal. They were college students. Yeah. I, I did a last, a, a couple weeks ago, I did a Zoom music trivia contest that a couple friends of mine run. And there's a bunch of people who I don't know. And I was put on a team with the dude randomly because it was just me and he didn't have any teammates. And so we would break off into you know, whatever small rooms to to go over our things. And this is a guy in his mid thirties or something, something like an adult. And I'm talking to him. And after about 10 minutes, like, I just got to say, this is a little weird for me because um, you performed at my uh, orientation weekend when I was in college. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to put this gun in my mouth now. (laughs) I said that to both. I said that to both Wally Collins and Tom Cotter. Oh yeah! They wow! Bo- they yeah. both performed they were like, uh-huh. at my college, and were you know the first comedians I'd ever seen, and made me want to do comedy for sure. Yeah, yep. 
I um, I used to work for the college radio station uh, for the year I was at the University of Calgary. That's before I went to McGill. And the big act they brought in, and she was a star, but not quite um, SPCA commercials yet, was Sarah McLaughlin. And I just remember I was her handler. And she was like, I want to call my boyfriend. And at the time, there were there was no cell phone people. I had to take her to a phone. And she just kept going to me. I'm so sorry. I'm like farting all over the place. Uh, <laughs> like, and then an hour later, <laughs> the arms of an angel. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. That so, yeah. Is she a- just doesn't seem like a farter. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, I think she knew it. I think she knew everything. It's that not was my. Going it's not on. her brand. Farting. Exactly. It was great. It was great. <laughs> oh, that is an that is a great story. And I don't know that we can top that. Christian, did you ever pick up before you even entered the field a uh, a uh, uh, big name person and hang out with them? No, no, I not like that. No, I mean that was another thing about being at NYU is that, like that's a why one of my major, major, major regrets about college is not having done the radio station. But like NYU, the radio station, you couldn't even hear it on campus because of the tall buildings right. and stuff, and so it just was kind of pointless. But yeah, no, I, I, so I did not have that experience, unfortunately. Well, I hung. That's where I hung out all the time. That's like, so cool. Days. That's so cool. That's a cool memory. That's an amazing memory. I would love to. I'd let, we have to get Sarah McLaughlin on. You have to get her on your show. Get her on. By the way, Ophira was on a right wing radio show on the oh, student. Oh, is that right? Yeah, was, exactly. Yes, it was a, uh... Uh, well, I'll let you guys go. But speaking of right wing radio, I don't know how much attention you've paid at all to politics, much less the news lately. Hopefully not too much. Uh, but I don't know if you heard that Fox News got caught. Saying one thing off air. And another thing on air, and now a lot of people are, you know, this whole lawsuit thing are saying this is it for them. Their reputation is tarnished, and and uh, they're finally have to be no, treated like the propaganda outfit that they clearly are. And Democrats are going to come hard against them. Finally, it looks like you're just setting us up to to. Undercut. I know failure. It's like we're talking about the Bible all over again. Well, it's like we're also <laughs> it's like we're also we're acting like these these people are acting in good faith in that, like, if only the Fox listeners had access to information, then they would see through this. They all know what it is. They know what it is. It's fine. Yeah. They're, they've all bought into it. It's 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 there's no you know, there's so there's that sort of trope in 80s and 90s movies where like the the poli- the crooked politician would get caught with a mic on and he'd be like screw the poor people i don't care about them and everybody in the audience would be like oh my god <laughs> that is such a fantasy that is such a fantasy that's just not the way the world works the uh, emperor's clothes they he, yeah he, he, they come off and you're like that's fine yeah or they yeah. just they just buy into it harder because it's like you know they say that 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 people who've been conned and when when they're faced with proof that they've been conned, they just dig, they buy in deeper because they That's can't, right. they can't accept it. I mean, I was just because I was researching and watching these clips, uh, but just reminded of it was on the Daily Show clip where, you know, these women at a the Trump not rally. It wasn't a rally was whatever that was uh, event where they were like, oh, yeah, there's two armies. Yeah. Trump has his own army. And that's the good army. And Biden has an army. And that's like the not good army. Right. And it's just like, yeah. They weren't joking. Like actual were... militaries. There's mm-hmm, two yeah. Yeah. Well, they have to believe that. Like, you know, I, there's a, a sort of a thing that I repeat to myself all the time, which is like people believe what they need to believe in order to do the things that they want to do. You know, that, that people assume that like, well, you have this, this set of beliefs that then informs the way you act. I think it's the exact opposite. I think people have a sort of lizard brain desire to act a certain way and they will adopt whatever beliefs will free them up morally to do that basically to do those things and so right. i want to be a part of an army a, a sort of right wing you know army to t- turn america back into 1984 again like culturally you know ni- or 1985 at 84 is a loaded year but like i want to roll the <laughs> I know, but it, i'm not making any orwellian statement i just picked a year at random but it's like i want to roll the dial of progress back 30 years and I will adopt whatever beliefs I need to believe in order to sort of justify that position. 
I think mm-hmm. that's so, yeah. so well said. Uh, and I am glad I asked because that's a really interesting I didn't way. steal from the government. I redistributed wealth. Pfft. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before I let you both go, finally, um, a suggestion for what to read, watch, or listen to. Of course, everybody should subscribe to New Music for Olds, and Christian always or, is suggesting great music. And you should subscribe to Ophira's podcast, Parenting is a Joke. Uh, but guys, suggest anything else along the lines of ro- watching, reading, or listening. And pick one or all, whatever you want. Uh, who wants to go first? Who's ready? I'm ready. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, party down on stars. If you don't have stars, it's only five bucks a month for the first three. You can get it and then cancel it. Uh, if you don't, if if you don't know, party down was a show that, uh, was around about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, very few people saw it, but so many people that were on the show have since become major celebrities like, uh, Adam Scott and Jane Lynch and Megan Mullally and, uh, Martin Starr. And it's so fucking hilarious it's just it's a show about a group of like out of work actors who are caterers and every episode is a different party that they have to cater and so it's a lot of sort of guest stars and it's incredibly funny incredibly well written and they sort of got the band back together for a new season and they i've only seen the first episode the the thing the second episode debuts today uh but it's just as funny like they managed to pick right up where it was like in terms of tone and uh paul rudd was one of the creators of it but he, even though he's not on it but um, it's a, a super show. So if you haven't watched any of it, I, I know that the first two seasons are streaming on, on I don't think, Hulu or Amazon mm. or something. Um, but it, I'm telling you, I unreservedly recommend Party Down. Great. That sounds I love the premise cool. alone. Uh, yeah. Party Amazing. Down, everybody. Ophira, what you got? OK, this is something very much in the wheelhouse of my podcast, but nonetheless, um, it's really good. Jessica Gross who is opinion writer at the New York Times, wrote a book um, called Screaming on the Inside, The Unsus- Unsustainability of American Motherhood. And it's just such, I mean, sometimes I find it hard to read, but it's such, so well written, such a smart book on contemporary parenting and just the historical roots and just even uh, like a path forward. I just find it like really one of the most interesting books I've read on sort of peeling apart what it is like to try to parent in the times of now in America. Screaming on the inside, the unsustainability of American motherhood. I guess my first question or only, you know, uh, is, is what's the difference between American motherhood and European or Asian or African or oh, ca- yeah. Canadian? Just, just mostly we're talking about um, the time off work, like all of the Lack social of programs, all of, all of the ways that, and just, you know, just in terms of how we have structured our community, um, so like, where, where do you find the people that are going to lift you up, support you and help you through this? And, you know, and, and so you don't just have to be like, I have a 17 figure job and 19 nannies and I bring in a chef occasionally and, you know, everyone does our dry cleaning. Like, that's not what we're talking about, but that's the a model that America is like, that's how you do it. Well, you can always aim for that. Yeah, I think the answer to every sort of 21st century conundrum conundrum is be rich. Yeah. (laughs) Christian Finnegan and Ophira Eisenberg. What a pleasure this was. As always, thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Pete. Bye, Pete. There they go, everybody. Christian Finnegan, Ophira Eisenberg, newmusicforolds.com. Go subscribe net right now, newmusicforolds.substack.com. Parenting as a Joke is an amazing podcast. See Ophira in Austin at South by Southwest. Go to their websites, all the information for both of them, and all of my guests are in every day's show notes. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, what? I await and for. And maybe today's the day that you want to give a review. Go over to iTunes and Apple. Rather, they're the same, Apple and Spotify, and also subscribe on YouTube as well. And you can watch some of the videos as well as all the rest of the social media. Thank you to Pete Co. for all the amazing intros this week. Thank you, as always, to John Carroll for his wonderful theme song. Thanks to everybody that subscribes to this podcast and supports my project and me and my work. I can't do it without you. Thank you for supporting independent media. It's free, but it's not cheap, and I really, really need your subscription. So if you haven't signed up, please think of it. Have a great weekend. Oh, and thanks to my intern, Odessa, of course, as well. Sorry, Odessa. 
And I will talk to you on Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 